we can extend this knowledge and pass it on from one generation to another. We remember this day, Father, this university, and the many, many passing out students and graduating students that have come through. And Father, we also remember the energy and the support system that has been in place through the lecturing team. We pray, mighty God, that Father, as we look forward to graduate another batch, you, in your wisdom, you would confirm your knowledge in every one of us. So that, Father, this nation will grow from strength to strength. And Lord, West Africa and Africa, and as a continent, Father, as, as a world, we would be beacons of hope for the generations to come. We remember before you the lecturer, Professor Fowl. We pray, mighty God, that in your wisdom you would contain and direct his thoughts. That, Lord, you would not only speak from knowledge or from experience, but from divine revelation relevant for our time and our space we pray mighty god that everyone who is seated here according to your wisdom and according to your patterns we would receive from you this day that would we'll leave this place and know indeed you this day that will leave this place and know indeed Thank you very much, Reverend Louis. And still in prayer, we would now sing the national prayer in the national anthem. I invite you all please to stand. Thank you very much. When the University of the Gambia was set up, it was not only set up to produce people who will have degrees, it was set up to train, enhance, and equip people who would participate meaningfully in nation building. There has been a trend that a lot of people lament about what has been going on, but do very little in contributing towards its change. At the University of the Gambia, we equip people to positively contribute in the transformation of this nation. And at the helm of our affairs 
is the Vice Chancellor of the University. Ladies and gentlemen, let me suggest to you that there are some people who have been given degrees because they never earned it. But there are some people who have earned their degrees. One of such is the Vice Chancellor. Would you give him an academic round of applause, please? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Honorable Chairman, Governing Council, Matthew Noor, Professor Jibril Fall, today's uh, chief guest and uh, convocation lecturer, PS, Ministry of Higher Education, Research, Science and Technology. historic as much as it is it is uh, eventful it is historic in the sense that today we were we work towards uh, re rekindling rekindling a, a university tradition that has had hitherto ceased to exist in UTG for years now this day is even for because today we restore not only tradition that we restore convocation lecture with our um, with our own erudite scholar professor Jibril Fall who is working in London School of Economics UK may I hasten to register our profound gratitude to Professor Jibril Fall for his Jibril Fall for his scholarship and love for the country, leaving behind a long list of of either pressing pressing engagements to honor our invitation in uh, as convocation lecturer at the 13th, 13th, 13th edi edition of the University of the Gambia Convocation. We are grateful and we, we hope and pray that uh, the Almighty will, will they reward you abundantly. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I, I implore and commend you to make best use of this lecture and lessons to be gathered from here to the to those graduating the lecture may mars you last lecture at university of the gambia for the degree you have worked for for during the past couple of years to you saying that this event is important would would be an an uh, understatement today we observe as a, an important co uh, important component of university culture and academic tradition so to you i say let the day be a memorable to you as the as the convocation ceremony for today you you receive tuition for life lessons. It is obvious that not all graduates in the 13th convocation had the opportunity of being lectured by an academic gem, a global citizen, to have a scholar who, who was who was who was uh, who has to speak on behalf of global civil society and joined the UN Secretary General to open the high level dialogue on migration and and international development 
to serve as convocation lecture on the theme university education and socio-economic development in the Gambia. It is truly an, an honor, therefore, having Professor Fall is our, our missed, could be considered a rare opportunity on this graceful occasion. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, with the revival of this prestigious lecture, Management of University of the Gambia reaffirms its commitment to adopting West helping staff in their research activities. This decision has led to the, uh, to the institutionalization, institutionalization of a monthly lecture series, Edward Francis Marr Lecture Series, named after the 20th century Gambian national, nationalist leader Edward Francis Marr, uh, celebrated by many scholars as the bias of conscience. We respect the lecture series in create to, cre to create a platform for faculty to present their search works and publish articles for the university community uh, to benefit from through, through our newly created Gambia Journal of Humanities and Sa Social Sciences. It is our, our conviction that although we have a long way to go, but with the commitment, uh, commitment in ensuring, to ensuring excellence through partnerships, innovation, and adoption of best practices, University of the Gambia will soon claim its glory of being a model university in the in this sub region once again on behalf of the governing council the senate staff and students of the university of the gambia welcome you all on this prestigious occasion especially i would like to thank the professor jibril jibril fall and his family who has who has joined this uh, occasion who has really graced this occasion with these few remarks thank you very much Thank you very much, Mr. Vice-Chancellor. I wish to make an appeal as we continue. There are times when you meet people who are of lowly state. There are times when you meet people who are humble and yet are of very high estate. Today, we meet in one of such. And for once, I took time to look at somebody's CV or a brief, brief write-up about that person, and I realized that this is one person who has affected 60 nations, even from the nation of the Gambia. My friends, <laughs> so if it happens that you are privileged amongst the many few in this nation to associate with such a person, please put your phones off or put them on vibration. Because if it was outside of here and your phone goes off, when somebody of such accolade is speaking, it 
will not be very nice. So I'll give you a few seconds to please put your phones on vibration. I'm sure you can applaud for that now, isn't it? Thank you very much. All right. All right. Today, we're privileged to have Professor Jibril Fall. Who is Professor Jibril Fall? He's a visiting professor in practice, the Institute of Global Affairs, London School of Economics and Political Science. He's the director, GK Partners and Consultant. He works at some point with the African Union. And as I begin to think about what that all means, I was given some papers to look at a summary of who he is. And I know some of you, all of you have got in a booklet, and you have looked at all the work that this man has been involved in, and you begin to ask yourself, how does he do it? Because for a man of his caliber, to be involved in all of this, and to be involved in all of this with Gambia as his foundation, then my friends, there's something about Gambia that we need to celebrate, and that is in the person of Professor Jibril Fall. <laughs> he is an international renowned multidisciplinarian with a diverse professional background. He's a business and development executive and practitioner, project and business implementer, researcher and professor, social entrepreneur, magistrate, policy expert, international negotiator, diaspora and international development leader. My friends, what should I say? He's also a Gambian. <laughs> professor Jibril. I know he doesn't like me saying all this, so he's in a hurry to come and talk. But I am one person who believes that if I die, don't celebrate me when I die. Celebrate me while I'm alive. And for some of us, Professor Gabriel, you will not understand. We have never seen somebody with all these accolades. So seeing somebody with this, I'm sure you'll want to have a photograph now. If you want to have one, please see me after this meeting. But I want to say that Professor Jibril has not only participated in international forums, Professor Jibril has also participated in the life of this nation and has done a lot of things. And I want to highlight one of that. Professor Fall provided financial, technical policy, and international lobbying and other support to coalition 2016, which won the presidential election in December 2016, ending dictatorship in the Gambia. On 11th February 2017, about a week after the appointment of the new cabinet of the coalition, Professor Ghibli Fall conducted an induction training session for the new cabinet ministers, followed by one-to-one -one briefing with the president. My friends, this is not only a teacher or a lecturer, he is now teaching presidents. <laughs> I thought you can clap for that now. I don't have a political party, so I will speak no further, and I will just say, Professor Jibril, with a round of applause and standing ovation, we can welcome him as he gives us the keynote address, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Vice Chancellor Professor Fakir Mohammed Anjum. Chairman of the Governing Council, Mr. Marty Undur, respected elders here present, members of the Governing Council and Senate, Vice-Chancellor Academics, Professor Per Gomez, Mr. Moderator, Mr. Manga, graduates, distinguished faculty, ladies and gentlemen, 
It is with honor and pleasure that I accepted the invitation to deliver the 13th Convocation Lecture of the University of the Gambia this 20th day of February 2021. Vice Chancellor and Chairman, if it pleases you, I shall speak on the topic of university education and socioeconomic development in the Gambia. In this lecture, I propose to place Gambia and Gambians within the tradition of university education globally. This episodic approach facilitates comparative analytical observations that may assist in the continuing contextualization of the role of higher education in general and the academic program of the University of the Gambia in particular. After a period of futile resistance, I too have recently become a subscriber to the ubiquitous phenomenon of a WhatsApp group. My group comprises classmates of the Gambia High School sixth form class of 1986. Every blessed dawn, a gentleman by the name of Arfan Sise, currently resident in the Kingdom of Norway, greets the class with prayers, joyful tidings, and words of wisdom for the day. Indeed, his name is Arfan, one of many nominative illustrations of how the veneration of knowledge, the pursuit of it, and the ca is casually ingrained in the cultural lives of the peoples of what is today the nation state of the Gambia. Afan means knowledge. Karamo means scholar. Kitabu, the book. Tafsir, explanation. All familiar names to us here in Gambia. At once, these names are expressive of the yearnings for knowledge and learning, whilst also indicative of the prodigious intellectual attainments of students, scholars, teachers within the community over a period of a millennium. These names also remind us of the foundational and intricate relationship between religion and organized learning and educational structures. Its links to arts, science, and technology, to human development in its multifarious manifestations. The story of higher education and the story of university education, to a great extent, is the story of organized religion. On the face of it, it may appear odd and incongruous that religions interested in the eternal fate of humans should be preoccupied by the banalities of education here on earth. Yet it was ever thus that earth and the hereafter, that knowledge of the gods, cognizance of the monotheistic god, and indeed the preferment of divine favors on earth and the hereafter require structured and organized education. Indeed, for almost all religions and creeds, which have exerted much influence on humanity, the achievement of a good life is predicated on knowledge of scripture, observance of rituals, and facilitation and guidance by a priestly class. It is no accident that the first graduates from institutions of higher learning in human history 
were the preferred clerics who attained enough learning and the abundance of virtue to go out into the world and minister to the souls of women and men and administer the affairs of humankind. Graduates, your historic predecessors were expected to guide the souls of humans to eternal salvation. Today, such a heavy burden is not placed upon your young and tender shoulders, but the expectation and responsibility to carry, you, you carry, is nonetheless high. Your professors and lecturers, the August Institution of the University of the Gambia, and your people, the Gambians, look to you to be both actor and factor in the socioeconomic advancement of your families, your communities, the country, and the global human family at large. In the Gambia, university graduates are still as part of a small group of people privileged to have gained so high a level of education with academic attainment. I invite you to embrace it with solemn humility and renew your dedication to national and community advancement through myriad positive ways made possible by your education and learning. In the academic literature, there is dispute and argument as to the origins of universities as we know them today. Yet, there is an evolutionary narrative that is plain, simple, and credibly supported by historic evidence. In the earliest times of human society, people marveled about the known world. They wondered about the unknown universe. They sought to understand cause and effect and yearned to know the nature of things. This was learning, this was not mere learning for survival. This was the beginnings of analytical thought as a discipline and higher learning as a preoccupation. It was, as, it was attractive to misfits and mystics, alchemists and magicians, hermits and heretics, philosophers and sophists. Like most human endeavors, higher learning did not evolve as pure virtue. As familiar, it had the good, the bad, and the ugly. It attracted people blessed with bright minds, incurable curiosity, extraordinary creativity, enduring diligence, and audacity to reason and question. Interestingly, these characteristics are still relevant to modern academic life. At the University of the Gambia, and universities across the world, for scholars to possess all the aforementioned traits is rare, but to possess none of them is untenable. There then we see the continuum and linkage between higher learning and antiquity and university careers in modernity. Ladies and gentlemen, and Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Higher Education, representing the minister. From the earliest thoughts, imaginings, experimentations, and misadventure, bodies of knowledge emerged. These evolved into universal mythologies, philosophical constructs, organized cults, and religious doctrines. The substance of emergent knowledge was complemented with strictures and pedagogy to manage how rarefied information 
and powerful new knowledge should be transferred from teacher to disciple, and how learned practitioners, namely priests, apply knowledge vis-a-vis -vis the rangs and wrongs of royalty and laity. The codes of secrecy and ethics govern the behavior of those privileged enough to have been brought into knowledge. These are the beginnings of curricula, codes, and conduct of higher learning. Witness how those learned clerics, those priest scholars of the cults and temples of antiquity, the predecessors of modern university graduates, had spectacular achievements in spiritual, conceptual, architectural, and order endeavors. Witness the inventive achievements of cultures and civilizations in different parts of the ancient world. There then we see the spiritual and the temporal, religious and secular, body and soul, conceptual and material, knowledge and skill, intertwined in the ancient centers of higher learning, UTG, and most modern universities need to navigate a path that balances pure and applied research, the imparting of conceptual knowledge, the stimulation of critical thinking, and training for occupational skills. In the fifth and sixth century of the Common Era, Christian monasteries spread from North and East Africa and the Levant to Europe. Many more, of the, many more of the contemplative and studious monks and nuns lived in these cloistered monasteries rather than in isolation as hermits. With the rise and spread of Islam and the great mosques and madrasas were built across Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Both monasteries and madrasas had formulaic architectural features to foster private and communal learning, ascetic and frugal living, prayer and worship, and the art and design to inspire divine contemplation. Indeed, the very language, regalia, and regulations of modern universities are derivative of ecclesiastical administration. Given the rarefied and somewhat esoteric origins of universities, it is not surprising that for many centuries it had been the preserve of small numbers of people. It became a privileged rite of passage for elite and socially ambitious families. Patterns of male domination excluded women from the hallowed halls of learning. And even when they were admitted to study, women were often denied formal admission to degrees and completed their studies without gaining recognized qualifications. Given that the intellectual exploration, exercise, and application was at the heart of university education, it is not surprising that bright young people gained admittance irrespective of their deprived economic backgrounds or lowly social class. Graduates, ladies and gentlemen, one way of understanding the nexus and correlation between university education and socioeconomic development is to examine and ponder on the otherwise innocuous word scholarship in all its meanings and implications. Today, the word scholarship retains its meaning of being the pursuit of higher learning as well as the derived meaning of being a financial grant to deserving students 
to facilitate their education. Universities strive to ensure that those who were capable of high learning would have the means and freedom to do so. Why would governments provide financial subventions to universities? Why would foundations and philanthropists fund universities? Why would families sell assets, acquire loans to pay for university fees? Why would companies sponsor employees to undertake further studies, costing them cash and loss in labor time? The underlying conceptual reason is that the scholarship fostered and nurtured by at universities generates public good of socioeconomic development. Sorry, generates public good, generates idealistic and practical results which accrue on individual, family, community, national and global levels. In sum, a public good of socioeconomic development is generated generated as measured through various indices and currently encapsulated in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations Agenda 2030. Let us now place that historical background with the reality of Gambia. Prior to colonization in 1821, Peoples inhabiting what now constitutes the boundaries of the Republic of the Gambia were already integrated in the scholastic life of Islamic West Africa. It is very likely that scholars from these lands attended and earned degrees at the University of Timbuktu from the 11th century onwards at the mosque madrasas of Sankore Jingerebe and Sidi Yahya. With the spread of Sufi traditions in the 18th and 19th century, many more would have been attracted to the universities in Fez in Morocco and in the Middle East. During the first 120 years of colonialism in Gambia, there was no structured or sustained program of university education. The historic record provides isolated cases of Gambians graduating from universities during those times. The current trend of an ever-growing number of Gambian young women and men earning university degrees can be traced back 75 years ago to the publication of the report of the Commission on Higher Education in the Colonies, published in May 1945 under the chairmanship of Justice Cyril Asquith. The report recommended the administration of entrance and scholarship exams and mentioned specific fields of study that needed to be promoted, namely medicine, agriculture, veterinary sciences, engineering, teaching, and law. These were in addition to disciplines more directly linked to public administration. It also encouraged colonial subjects to study within the British colonies and dominions and to be sent to the United Kingdom only for specialist courses. From then, from 1945 until 1970, one can find a direct correlation between the growing number of Gambian University graduates and the recommendations of that report. But let's go back a little bit before 1945. If you read books on West African history and politics, you would come across a Nigerian barrister and politician, Joseph Egerton Singul. He was a Gambian. 
who studied in the United Kingdom before resettling in Nigeria. He was enrolled at the Supreme Court of Nigeria in 1892 and became the first president of a political party in Nigeria in 1923. He started his schooling in Banjul, then attended the church mission school, CMS Grammar School, and Forabe College, Sierra Leone, in Sierra Leone. We know this fact partly from the writings of Dr. Florence Mahoney. Single matriculated at Christ College University of Oxford on the 31st of May, 1884. We do not have a record of him, of him graduating. So I cannot claim him to be the first Gambian graduate of a modern university. At the time, you could train, you could take articles and be trained as a lawyer. So we know for sure that he is the first Gambian barrister, having been called to the English bar at the Inner Temple in 1888. The accolade for being the first Gambian to earn a modern university degree has to go to Sir Samuel John Foster, Jr. He was the first Gambian to practice law in Gambia. He started his education at the Wesleyan Boys High School in Banjul and proceeded to CMS Grammar School in Freetown. In 1889, he traveled to the United States attending Epworth, attending Epworth College in Ryle in North Wales. Epworth College in Ryle in North Wales and Liverpool Institute High School for Boys. Then in 1892, he studied for his Oxford entrance exams at Abingdon School, which is one of the oldest schools in the United Kingdom, having been first founded as part of the Abingdon Abbey in 675 in the Common Era. Interestingly, Foster was the goalkeeper and captain of the football team at Abingdon School. Three of the four issues of the school newspaper of 1893 carried reports about Samuel Foster being part of the football team, interestingly with no reference to his race or African origin. But we are pleased that the records actually show a photograph of him in the football team. He went up to Merton College, University of Oxford in 1893, graduating in 1896. He was called to the English bar at Inner Temple in 1898. Having spent 10 years in the United Kingdom, he returned home in 1899. He was a long-serving member of the Legislative Council, having been nominated by the governor, and in 1933, became the first Gambian to be knighted. The politically influential West African Students' Union was set up in London on the 7th of August, 1925, by 21 African students, including, one of, including many of the people who led the nationalist and independent movements in West Africa. One of the founding members was a Gambian graduate, Wilfred Davidson Carroll. W.D. Carroll started his education at Wesley Boys in Banjul before traveling to the United Kingdom in 1920 to study at Merton College, University of Oxford. He graduated in 1923 and was called to the English Bar in 1924 and returned home in 1925, soon after the formation of the West African Student Union. I had the privilege to examine his shipping record. He was on the MV Elphesis, a Greek registered vessel that docked at Falmouth on the 1st of August, 1920. The Gambia had its first national legislative elections in May of 1960. And in March of 1961, 
Pierre Sarnjai, Pierre Sarnjai of the United Party, was appointed first chief minister of Gambia. Having previously enrolled at King's College London in 1943, he later qualified as a barrister in 1948. His younger brother and deputy leader of the United Party, Ibrahim Daur Njai, Idi Njai, also lived in the United Kingdom. He studied sociology at my institution, the London School of Economics, in 1944 to 1946. And after working as a Gambian social welfare officer, he returned to London in 1955 and was called to the English bar at Lincoln's Inn in 1958. We see a pattern in the graduates prior to the Asquith report of 1945. They were all private students, supported by wealthy families or self-supporting. They were involved in political activism against colonization and pioneered what became the Gambianization of the professional classes. These and later graduates had a transformative impact on Gambian politics. After 1945, a small number of privately sponsored students continued to travel to for university education. Between 1945 and 1955, we had the first wave of scholarship students correlating to the Asquith recommendations. They were from diverse and underprivileged backgrounds. These students had excelled and won scholarships at school, and they studied in the UK and the Commonwealth, mainly Sierra Leone, Ghana, and Nigeria. By the 1960s, Gambians were attending universities in the dominions of New Zealand and Canada and in the United States of America. The first Gambian from the rural area, the protectorate, to earn a university degree was a gentleman by the name of Sehu Almami Jawara, who would later become Sadauda Kedaba Jawara, the first president of the Republic of the Gambia. He attended University of Glasgow in 1948, becoming the first Gambian veterinary surgeon in 1952. Jawara was on the same ship the MV McGregor led with Cherno Ibrahima Jain, C.I. Jain, who attended the University of Wales Aberystwyth and later served as the town clerk of the Bathurst Town Council. A woman, Dr. Florence Mahoney, became the first Gambian to earn a, uni a, a Doctor of Philosophy degree in 1963 from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. The first Gambian director of agriculture, Dr. Lamin John Saba Marena, arrived in the northeast of England in 1953, studying at the universities of Durham and New Caledonia. In 1966, he became the first Gambian man to earn a PhD. That is the first 10 years of the Asquith report. Then what happened? What is it that happened after the first 10 years? So we come to, a 20, to the period 1956, 20-year period, 1956 to 1975, which in my reckoning is the wave of university graduates that had a critical mass in numbers that had a major impact on Gambian politics, society, and economics. And how did the numbers of graduates grow? 1959, you have Gambia High School as an amalgamation of pre-existing school. And it started producing its sixth form graduates. You had Yundum College as a teacher training institute producing graduates, both these sources started winning government scholarships 
and going to study for their degrees. We have the African Scholarship Program of American Universities, the ASPAO program. Gambians winning ASPAO scholarships and going to the United States to study. We have for the first time the wave of Gambian private students, privately sponsored students, going to the United States, not the United Kingdom, for higher education. We had school leavers, non-high school leavers in, the United, in Gambia, traveling to the United Kingdom, attending adult institutions in order to gain A-levels to start their degrees. For the group of private students who went to the United States, we had people who had passed their exams as teachers at Yundum College, who would enroll at high school, win all the prizes at the exams, and enter the great halls of the Ivy League. And many of them are still with us now, having acquired their degrees from the best institutions in the world. For the groups that went to the United Kingdom, it took them very many years to get their degrees. They had to do their O levels, their A levels, and the dreaded University of London external exams. When you finish your exam in the height of spring, you wait for the onset of summer for the results to be published. I've heard stories of people caught up in the anxiety of what would Senate House say to them. For when the result is due, it would be posted at the atrium of Senate House at Mallet Street, London. So you have to come to see whether your name is there or not. And if it is not there, it is another year of work, hard work, and more exams for a person who is not getting younger. Then we had the wave of students going to the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact countries, and what is now the Confederation of Independent States from Ukraine, big country, to small Moldova, to Russia, to all of the stands, Gambians went there to study. A very small number also went to Scandinavia, mainly Sweden, to study at the universities. <coughs> I am very interested in this group because I think they were the critical group, 1956 to 1975. Some of the people who graduated in those years would have had their degrees for over 50 years now. Is there anyone in the room who had their degree about 50 years ago? There should be one or two. Now, this group, you had, they came back with their degrees and they did two things. They went into teaching directly or they went into public service. Some went into teaching before going into public service. I call them the PGCEs. This is the legion of the PGCEs. You would have a name, Mr. So and So, B.A. Geography Donnell, PGCE. The Donnell is University of, Jur of, of Durham, which Fora Bay College in Sierra Leone was a college of the University of Durham. So you go to Fora Bay and earn your Durham degree. So Mr. So and So, B.A. Honors Donnell, PGCE. Ms. So and So, BSc Honors Legon PGCE. Miss So and So MA Oxford PGCE. These PGCEs 
transform the few high schools and help to breathe in a culture of learning. For what happened between the dawn of colonialism up to 1945, the numbers of graduates were never many enough to have a major influence or inspiration. From 1945, it began to change. The thirst for knowledge among young, ambitious people grew. And they were inspired by the returning graduates. The very sharp pleats of their skirts, the coiffed hair, influenced by Marie Claire. These are the women graduates. They were no longer just part of the audience and the realities and the sensitivities of the colony of Banjul. They were now part of a global world with an understanding of global culture and sensitivities. The men with their refined accents their pipes and the so and the Saint Bruno tobacco. They inspired many a young man to learn Latin to learn the law of the natural sciences. We had young men and young women now believing that they can be part of the socioeconomic change. For these young graduates returning, we are not 10 years older than them. And they also came from backgrounds that were not monet or overprivileged. I have learned that young men would be in the streets of Banjul at night to use the street lights so that they can study. I learned that they would exclaim when a concept finally breaks through and they understand it, or when they've memorized a sonnet by Shakespeare, or understood the intricacies of Latin grammar, they would exclaim, Barke Janga, blessed are the learning, for that is what that exclamation is, Barke Janga. Ndonga Dara Yangi Joy by Sorin Allen. A boy's lamentation about young scholars weeping homesick away from father, all in this love of knowledge and the want of knowledge. So let us learn so that we will know. Let us know so that we will do. And let us do so that we will be fulfillment through learning and knowledge. One of the most fascinating concepts in modern economics is the concept of food security. It had baffled me for a long time. For common sense tells us that famines happen when there is no food. That would be common sense and humankind had lived for millennia believing in this simple reality. Then the Indian Nobel laureate Amartya Sen came onto the scene and he says no, famines are not caused by the lack of food but by the lack of food security. And of course they say explain. He said, and this now applies not only to food, let's say phenomena. 
He said with phenomena of food, you have availability, you have accessibility, and you have affordability issues. And many famines that I examined, food was available to an extent accessible, sometimes not, and to an extent not affordable, often not. That inspired me to have a look at how then do we encapsulate and conceptualize this big idea of socioeconomic development. And many years ago, it came to me that I think one can reduce it to what I call the five L's. That development, you can forget the indices of the GDP or the Human Development Index and all of the other econometrics. You can understand it in the lives of people. And I think, in a sense, socioeconomic development is about the, having the ability to do one of two things, to protect life and limb, and to enhance livelihood lifestyles. To protect life, limb, and liberty, those are the first three things, and to enhance livelihood and lifestyles. So just reflect on it for a moment. If one is asking you whether you have socioeconomic power, would you measure it with your balance at the bank? Would you measure it with the political influence you have? Would you measure it with the social capital you have? And are these not many measures not dizzying to the brain? The simpler test is, to what extent am I able to protect my and my people's life, limb, and liberty? And to what extent can I enhance lifestyles and livelihoods? The 1956-1975 generation, they were motivated by something else. They wanted to come back as one of my brothers, attorney at law, Idirisa Emofal, once put it. They wanted to be back soon to fight poverty, to fight poverty in the family, to fight poverty in the community and to fight poverty in the country. And guess what? They could imagine that, they could wish for it, they could have the ambition for it because there was a critical mass of people from similar or even humbler backgrounds who could do that. So the five L's, remember it graduates, that the impact that you may have, you can forget if you want all of the indices, but how much can you help to protect life, limb, and liberty? How much can you help to enhance livelihood and lifestyles? We always need inspiration to keep going. So you have a critical mass having a big impact. Can we assume that when you have good things happening, can we assume that it would keep happening and keep improving? Again, common sense tells us that yes, if you are improving, things should get better. And it was ever thus, until Francis Galton came on the scene. By very many means, he was a horrible man. By the way, he's the one who gave a standard deviation in mathematics. For that reason alone, he is a horrible man. <laughs> but he was a eugenist, which makes him even worse. But Francis Galton tells us that it is not true. Things cannot improve forever. He said they would return to the mean. This is the concept of returning to the mean. And he had used a number of explanations, and some of it vulgar, 
For example, if you have two beautiful people and they get married and they have a beautiful child, and the beautiful child marries another beautiful, grows up and marries another beautiful person, they would have an even more beautiful person. To what extent do you go to have the ultimate beauty? He says it will return to the mean because at some point they will not have beauty in the crib. They will have a monstrous baby in the crib. So if this were to be true, what do we need to do to avoid that regression and that return to the mean? That is very important for scholars and it's very important for students. It means that we have to find devices and techniques for renewal and reinvention. And the, in Galton's examples in genetic terms, that means at some point you go out and marry yourself an ugly man. It's about genetic infusion. Or go out of the village and go to another place and find someone else. So this is the innovation and the invention that is needed. The world of business understands this more than any other discipline. This is why when you spend your well-earned money buying your latest mobile phone, even before you know all the functionalities, they claim that they've invented an even better one. In most cases, it is true, because it's called product life cycle. And the masters of the capitalist world are better at it than anyone else. They know that if they don't do it, it will return to the mean. So they keep the reinvention. Vice Chairman, Vice Chancellor, we need the students to be constantly re-inspired so that the youngsters who exclaimed Barke Janga will be echoed in this generation as well. Why is that so? Because university education and you, the graduates, they still constitute an important part of sociological elite formation. In the Gambia, if you have a university degree, you are still part of the three to four percent, if that. That is a very special group, isn't it? With it comes responsibilities. With it comes burdens. And with it comes the need for a moral compass. This is why, going back to the origins of the university, the institutions have always differentiated between learning the knowledge and being admitted to a degree or better still, to be admitted to a vocation. Because the moral ethics and all the responsibilities are beyond just the knowledge. What those codes are in current 21st century Gambia, I do not know. But it is for the university and the intellectual classes to ponder upon it and to discourse for the answers are indeed needed. What the university does, and it's under a duty to do, is that it cannot just be for knowledge. It has to do skills. And there are mixed views about this. There are purists who believe that knowledge is needed for knowledge's sake that it is almost vulgar to seek to attach skills to it. I think that difficult is getting more and more difficult to sustain in the modern world. But it did have a great grip. 
up to maybe about 50 to 60 years ago, for most, I'll put it another way, going back a couple of hundred years, the main professions or the disciplines that were considered professions were very narrow. It was legal, medical, and clerical. Everyone else was in a vocation. But there was always a sense of snobbery about it. Because for even these three, they still have to do the vocational element. You learn your law, but you do your vocational training to become a solicitor or a barrister. And that inn that you belong to or that bar is in effect a glorified worker's guild. It's a throwback from the medieval worker's guild. Guess what? Not too dissimilar to the carpenter's guild or to the merchant's guild or to the chandeliers or any other trade. You train as a medical doctor, you are admitted into the faculty. But who actually was a professional as a medical doctor? It was the physician, not the surgeon. The surgeon who butchers people belonged to the same guild as the barbers. And that was true in England until about just over 100 years ago. You belong to the guild of surgeons and barbers. Now you can see where the snobbery about skills and vocations came from. The church, you study divinity, but what is the expression, sir? You are called to your vocation. You have to. So knowledge of scripture is not enough. You're called into a vocation. So what is our vocation now that you've got your degrees? What is it? What is your moral compass that guides you as an IT graduate or a banking graduate? I do not know the answer, but we need an answer for Gambia in the context of the development challenges of the Gambia. For the university and for higher education, We've noticed that the power of learning tend to do two things. It acts as a magnet for researchers and bright minds. And it can act as a cluster former from those who leave it. The magnet is the way you run your institution would attract the brightest researchers and students. And they bounce upon each other and generate the most beautiful of sublime knowledge and products. The cluster, people have studied this. They've looked at, for example, the IT world, and they looked at the company Intel, and they could track something like over a thousand successful companies, all of which could be sourced back to California and the Intel company. The University of Cambridge, it was disgruntled scholars from Oxford who went away and set up Cambridge. And there's a well-established pattern of that. Bojange, Bomokale, Bersadara. Pursue your studies, master your subjects, set up your school. But beware the folly of setting up your school before you've mastered your subject. Vice Chancellor, many higher education institutions face a constant challenge regarding finance and how to maintain the increasing cost of education. The University of the Gambia gets a subvention. The amount it raises from university fees is a very small percentage of its budget. The students will not like hearing it because they think the fees are already too high. 
So what is it? How can one solve this problem? One of the most successful universities in the world is Harvard, with whatever metric that you choose to measure with. The tuition fee per year undergraduate is about $50,000, meaning in four years is $200,000. And that is, you, you haven't got a room, you haven't got a bed, you haven't got food yet. If you add all of that, it's 75000 But fees only constitutes 22% of the income as well. So that mathematic, that arithmetic is not dissimilar with other universities. The difference is they're not getting a government subvention. Where are they getting their money from? They're getting their money from a $40 billion endowment. Money that have been generated, given to them mostly, that they put as an endowment, they invest, and they earn about $2 billion from it every year. That is why if you are lucky enough to be admitted at the Harvard program, you stand a very good chance of them paying for the pleasure of having you. <laughs> yeah? Now, one must examine in the next five to 10 years where the different models of investment within UTG need to be considered. Whether the government in its annual subvention should add a top up which will not be spent, but will be invested. Whether the university will begin to go around and find its successful alumni and seek donations from them. Whether it can get companies to give them shares. That model is worth looking into. Why would universities need to lead with these things? Because if you are an institution of higher learning, you are in a kind of catch-22. You cannot claim not to have many of the answers because people will point back and say, but you are among the cleverest people. So if you cannot figure it out, who will? So it is there for the young graduates. The challenge is out there. And it is a challenge that other institutions of learning have been able to manage over the millennia, over the centuries. And the freedom to think and to reason and to question, the support institutional that the students need to experiment, to try, and to fail safely within the place, the courage that should be given to them to venture and try out things are all part of the mix that would be needed for the 21st century university. Harvard leads many follows. My own university has quite a tidy endowment and men and attracts many donations from alumni and others. So endowed chairs might be something to look at. But overall, I leave you with this thought. Now the numbers are growing. The percentage of women in the mix is growing. If the trend continues, a time will come, UTG will graduate more women than men, for that is the reality in many other countries. What might be missing is that little bit of spark that allow graduates to aspire not to get a job, but to aspire to create jobs. Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your kind attention. I'm sure you can do better. Please be seated. I'm a
Thank you very much. Wow. You know, as, he sat, uh, as I sat down there and he was speaking, I realized, are you sure you have a degree? Because I realized there's a lot more that I have to learn. And I thought I was up there, but I want to humble myself that, sir, I am ready to learn more. Thank you very much, Professor Jibril Fahal. You see, one thing I realized about professors, they don't seek to answer questions for you. They don't seek to spin, spoon feed you. They provoke you and leave you halfway and allow you to think the rest. And then it is interesting that Professor was speaking and right before him was a Reverend Minister. And so he said to the Reverend Minister, what is your vocation? And the man, instead of looking at him, he was looking at me. And I was wondering, I am here with Nectar. You are the one with the collar. It's you he's speaking to, not me. Uh -huh. But then, as he said, what is your vocation as a graduate? I thought, all right, this is the Gambia. What happens in the Gambia as a vocation of, of as a graduate as well. How much money do we spend in seeking to have a career or create careers? Prof. There are so many profs, so all of them are looking at me. Now the one with the gun and they talk. The rest today, you wear suit like me. Have you realized if I may, that the fuller man makes a lot of money in Brusby. And please forgive me, but let me justify my point. A box of chicken, chicken legs, is a thousand dollars. The last time I checked, there are about 24 to 30 pieces in that box. They grill it, or they fry it, they add a bit of spaghetti, they add a bit of ketchup and onions, uh -huh. and they sell it at $100. 100 times 24 is how much? 2,400. They only spend 1,500. So by default, it means for every box that is sold, they're getting $900. And so if, as Prof said, chaf kabangfa, a lot of us university graduates, we go and get it, and so in a month, they will sell a lot of more boxes. 900 times the number of boxes. Maybe they're making more funds than some of us who are graduates. My friends, with your degree, are you seeking for a job? Or are you creating job opportunities? Professor Gibral Tal, Thank you very much for raising and challenging us that for all of us, we can but do it. And this nation is waiting for the manifestation of all of us as graduates so that we will not be lamenting about Gambia, but we will be talking about a new Gambia that is moving forward and that will continue to take its place in the Commonwealth of Nations. Professor Jibril Fahl, thank you very much for inspiring us and God richly bless you. I am sure all of us can stand and give a round of applause to this illustrious son of the nation, <laughs> Professor Jibril Tal. You know, I am Jola. If you clap like this for me, I won't come again. You have seen all the things that have been written about him. You want someone like this to be visiting our university. Can you clap like a good Gambian person? Thank you very much. Aha! Uh -huh. I am sure you can do better. Aha! Uh -huh.
Now he will be happy and maybe he will give some of us scholarships, Abby. Aha. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Please, if this is, I know I Africa is covering this. If scholarships are going to be awarded, remember I was the MC today. <laughs> we want to call on our acting Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic in the person of Professor Per Gomez to give the vote of thanks. I miss you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mamudu. Thank you very much, MC. Sorry, I lost my voice. So. Honorable Minister of Higher Education, Research, Science, and Technology, ably represented by the Permanent sec Secretary, Mr. Motseka. Convocation Lecturer, Professor Jibril Fall, Chairman and members of the University Governing Council, Venerable Religious Leaders, Faculty Members, and Senior Management, Staff and Students of the University of the Gambia, Friends of UTG, distinguished graduates, members of the media fraternity, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me use this moment to say how delighted I am that this day has finally come to pass. I believe that this day connects our past to the future of UTG, knowing that today we have successfully reinst reinstalled an academic tradition that has ceased to exist at UTG for over a decade. Yes, for over a decade, we did not have a con convocation lecture. We must go back to tradition. We must go back to roots this cult university culture, the sanctity of this institution must be adhered to at all costs. This is history in the making, and I am grateful to be part of it. My role today is a solemn one. It is to say thank you to you all on behalf of UTG management, staff members, and students. It is to recognize your efforts and contributions to the success of this day, and I promise to do just that. I therefore must hasten to recognize first today's lecturer, Professor Gibril Fall, for accepting our invitation to conduct this lecture, and you will all agree with me as the MC rightly said that we could not have had a better lecturer on this theme. Professor Fall has the knowledge, skills, exposure, and experience to contextualize the role of university education to the socioeconomic advancement of the Gambia. For this scintillate scintillating lecture, we are grateful. We appreciate your dedication to our cause. Having to travel long hours from UK to the Gambia, despite the travel restrictions due to the pandemic. We are indebted to you, but like Oliver Twist, we still ask for more hoping and praying 
that this will not be our last. We pray for your continued good health and strength to continue inspiring the world. And UTG, the doors of UTG are widely open. As students of literature, like Dr. Dr. Landry Peters would say, open the gates, and we've opened the doors of the university for our knowledge, skills to enter. So, Prof. Fall, please, whenever time permits, come to UTG. The students, lecturers, will be more than happy to welcome you and so that we come back again round the table of academic banquet. We are proud of you. Jere Jeff, bro. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, this event might not have been successful without the support of our line ministry under the dynamic leadership of Arevul Badarajouf, ably represented here by the Permanent Secretary, Motseka. Sir, your guidance and institutional support to UTG are well appreciated. Special thanks to the UTG Governing Council, Mr. Matthew Ndur and his team. We are appreciative of your contributions to the success of this day and for being there each time we had to knock your doors, sometimes at the expense of your leisure. Thank you, sir. May you live long. In line with the promise of monthly Edward Francis Small lecture series, as clearly stated by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Fakir Mohammed Anjum, we express our sincere words of gratitude to our CEO himself, Vice Chancellor Professor Faki Muhammad Anjum, for his commitment to excellence. Working closely with you, I've learned to appreciate that promise of success may seem like a mirage, but it is not impossible, and that is the spirit indeed to make UTG a model in the sub-region. We thank you for your exemplary leadership in steering the affairs of UTG, the premier uni uh, university in the Gambia. For expert contributions, we appreciate the participation of members of Senate, deans and heads of departments. I must emphasize that consultations with them has been fruitful. And it is the fruits of those consultations that have brought us all here this evening. You may have done what you did out of duty, but we still say thank you, for you have done it well. If there is a third pillar to the success of this day, that would be faculty and students. This day would not be meaningful if faculty and students aren't fairly re uh, represented. To this group, I recommend that the lessons learned here be held dear and that it be part of the legacy you transfer to those that look up to you. Our words of gratitude cannot be complete without acknowledging the organizing committee of the 13th Convocation of UTG, Reverend Banimanga and team. You have served with dedication and commitment, and I am certain that when you lay your head on your pillow tonight, you will sleep well knowing that you have contributed to making history. We thank you very much for that quality service.
We are here assured that the world is watching, that the world knows what we are doing here, thanks to the print and electronic media. To all media houses here present, we say thank you for being partners, for being agents of change for development. I cannot leave the podium without saying thank you to all those invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, who have left other engagements to grace this occasion. I commit you into the hands of our Lord Almighty to see you safely into your respective homes. Amen. Finally, I cannot be ungrateful not to appreciate our moderator, who happened to be Professor Sansar, but because of some uh, uh, unforeseen circumstances, he could not join the high table, but he seated right, right uh, over there. Professor Sar, the Director of Graduate Studies at Ohio University, the United States of America. <laughs> Professor Sar, you are welcome. Might I use this opportunity to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this day and for all previous services to UTG. We are indebted and pray for God's guidance at all times until we converge here again next year. Shalom. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much. Um, one of the things I don't like at uh, functions is that some people refuse to thank themselves. So I'm going to help to thank somebody who is refusing to thank himself. When Professor Hassan, um, Professor Jibril was speaking, he acknowledged that for some of us, when we, well, not some of us, some of our older ones, when they traveled outside, and they came, they changed their accents so that those of the others will start following them. Can you imagine Manjago speaking like this now? <laughs> Please don't record that one. Uh, I don't want them to meet me outside. Eh? Uh -huh. But can you hear how Professor Gomez was pronouncing today? Eh? Hey. This is 56 years of Gambian independence. Well. Before, uh, Professor Hassan, you will come forward so that we'll see. But before I call you, let me tell you something that um, happened. I went somewhere where they were talking about academics and they wanted to introduce this person. And um, the, the moderator, like myself, was somehow a bit naughty. So I think the man was Manjago, I presume so. No, 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 I was told he's Jola. So he said, I want to introduce to you somebody who has gone to um, the Methodist Boys High School in Banjul. Can you give a round of applause, please? He went from the Methodist Boys High School to Fuller Bay College. And from Fuller Bay College, he went to the University of Durham. Can you give a round of applause as he got his diploma? From the University of Durham, he went to the University of Cambridge and had his first degree, Bachelor's of Arts in comparative literature. My friends, from there he went to the University of Oxford and had a master's degree. The rest of the degrees, then <laughs> The people who are speaking here, their degrees are not dashed. They work for it. So as a matter of fact, since Professor Hassan is here, you need to see him. I invite Professor Hassan to come. Mr. Cora player, give appropriate music as you invite him. You see how Americans they walk, huh? <laughs> Please clap for him. You don't know if you're going to get visa from him now. Huh? <laughs> Professor Hassan, I know you were supposed to be the moderator. And I'm sure a lot of people don't know you. It will be good to hear your voice. Please, a short word from Professor Hassan. I'm sure you can do better. Boy, did I say I'm Yeah, Professor Hassan. Mm, we 
<laughs> Thank you very much and, and good evening, uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor um, and our distinguished guests present here. Uh, I am part of the UTG family because I received my undergraduate degree from this institution um, many, many years ago. I could not believe it. Clap for UTG now. <laughs> And I have started, I started teaching at UTG on and off uh, as a visiting scholar back in 2007 uh, while I was a doctoral student at Michigan State University. Uh, I am currently here at, on sabbatical until August. Um, and I am very, very delighted to be here to grace this occasion and to listen to this illuminating um, uh, convocation lecture from Professor Jibril Fahl, whose name I know very well, but I've never had a chance to meet him. Uh, this is really um, uh, a wonderful day, and I congratulate the graduates, my younger siblings, um, who are uh, actually joining the community of scholars uh, from wherever they end up going to, uh, I really like uh, many of the messages that uh, were uh, punctuated within the uh, uh, you know, speech that Professor Fall gave. I think values uh, are really critical. What distinguishes scholars from the general community is those values that we take uh, from learning and applying those values, uh, using it for the common good of society. How do we transform society? Uh, so I do not want to give any other lecture because that will be, I think, a, um, uh, you know, um, a violation of the, of the, of the, of the, of the honor that we, we would give to our, our distinguished guests. Uh, but I'm just very inspired, I'm very happy, and I'm very happy to be back uh, in my um, academic home, well, the other academic home, uh, UTG, the first one. So thank you very much, and God bless you all. Thank you very much, Professor Hassan. From here, we would all move out gradually um, to the front view. There is a cocktail refreshment um, reception that is, will be hosted um, so that all of us would interact, um, discuss further, take photos as much as possible with Professor Hassan um, within the context of COVID. Um, Also, um, we want to announce that next week, next week Saturday, would be the 13th convocation ceremony at the Q City. It will be covered live um, by all the media um, outlets that we have. But because of COVID, we are restricting numbers. We have um, quite a bit of students who are graduating and we have to we have to set the standards as has been heard here. And so for that reason, it will be strictly by invitation. Um, for some of us who would want to take photos, you would always have that opportunity of doing that. And we hope that that will be respected and honored. Um, thank you very much. We're going to please stand and we're going to sing the national anthem. Um, Mr. Balamin will help us with the um, tune, but we're going to sing it. This is our national song. And so let's see what we can do with our national song. <laughs>
you very much. The pride we take in our brand, the work we put in to constantly change the landscape and elevate real estate in the Gambia, it's compared to none. From inception, our goal was to add value to the beautiful Gambian landscape. That's why we are proud innovators of community estates. Kololi Sands is an exceptional piece of work, tailored for ultimate convenience and luxury to bring you an element of finesse that is rare but unique in its own. This is also our pride and joy and we welcome you to the exquisite beauty right here in Kololi and right here on the waterfront. Kololi Sands, feel the ocean breeze at your doorstep. Bari <laughs> Baluo. Ha. Wait. For Baluo Koloro fanankele. Ikaloro Anila Fana yi yenga tu ci walum ñew ñu gi gëna mag di gëna yaatu taxna tay ubil na ndaw yi ay buntu pour ñu gëna bay seen war ci walum ñew mën nañ la tektal ci buntu yu wor yoy jaar fi ci rew wi gambia ndaw yi yengu ci walum ñew nak ñu ngi jëriño xam xam yi jëlé SNS Institute of Creative Design ngir gëna yokko seen man man ci walum métier gi té kayti janga yitam yombal na seen am liggéey wala start seen business bop Jango kagi nak emu ci jangal ak jox la keet wante dinañ la xalal ci noy amé liggéey ak wajal lead interview mba boko ci nit ñi yakarné budul jaaré yoni gannaaw duñ fi mëna téké kon nak jaaral ci wakawel.info/gambia ngir mëna am xibaar yu wor ci anam yi nga wara jaar bo bëggé tukki bitim rew mba soxla janga ut liggéey ak mbiri jula fi ci bir rew mi GSM Sta GSM fele promotion bana fina molie minul be mararing tanko bundala Gambia Banko Kanjang minu buko police hole armed force hole immigration customs anil lan yurtol da talar bala keta smartphone la min ka sanu wini woro wala sang wini woro do ma isa soto min ka sanu wini woro sang wini lu min ka sanu wini lu sang wini nani man da smartphone do ma simple phone ol fanan minul ka sanu kemenu la sang kemenani talulu min be kemenani talulu sang kemesa ba talulu ning original techno simple phone min ka sanu keme kolontola sang keme woro wala isa soto mobile ambulance keme woro do ma sta gsm ya tablet so tole pro din ni wol wuli ki lin keme sey do ma isa soto nyin tablet ul milka sim card wuta wuli fula keme saba isa soto hd universal remote ul fanam bi jele flat screen ul min ya lon ko la receiver be konole 42 lombang wala 43 inches isi soto no 4999 dalasis wala 
$8,999. Star GSM Manda Wodom Mala. Nanyu original face max soul sotole. Minsal tanka coronavirus sotola. Na air fresinal fanan sotole. Pur alla sabati din kiral. Anyu official. Nyim bala muran tulul fanan bijele. Nyum flash kopol. Kabonali America. Al se muna fangala la official do. Wara alla sabati din kiral. Pur jikando. Wala jisuma. Anda se sambano tilo mume. Nanyu designer spray fanan sotale. Min sero katara fango bala fo monturo wati mwani nani. Andi bota nam France le anin Dubai. Isina njibe no na bumbato mimfele kombo sila drive serekunda. Oje Johnson nyati lingola. Wala na nyun kunkili mbitikul mimfele talindi marseto anin tabo koto traffic light hoto. Isi nkumandino 700-2494 wala 990-1122. Star GSM mfananka nkato dango kele puru mimbe banko sambala nyato. Star GSM the best phone in the Gambia, Afrifoon, is back in a brand new style. Afrisal, the biggest and the best GSM operator in the Gambia, is setting trends once again. Get an Afrifoon for $350 only and receive one hour of free talk time spread over three months. $350 is only you can get a dual SIM phone with a wireless FM radio, memory card slot, internet access, long-lasting battery, and one hour of free talk time. Where Afrisal goes, oh, oh, nobody. There's to follow. There's to follow. Afrisal is setting trends once again. I'm sure you still love WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and Viber. Your favorite GSM operator, Afrisal, knows this. That's why you can now enjoy more at the same price. Activate the social media bundle and be online for 24 hours for ten dollars is only. Hello. Activate the social media bundle for ten dollars is only and receive 40 megabytes. Where Africell goes, oh, oh, nobody dares to follow. Dares to follow. Debunking COVID-19 myths. Myth one. This is your young lady, so boy, Max, we are tango.